pain is temporary. It may last for a minute or an hour or a day or even a year. But eventually it will subside and something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it will last forever. Listen to me, I'm telling you as I leave, I'm telling you as I leave, I was homeless for two and a half years. And the problem with most of you, you never felt no pain before, y'all spoiled. Y'all spoiled, some of y'all spoiled, just bottom line. Your parents have done everything for you. You never had to do nothing for yourself, you're spoiled. We're gonna keep it real tonight. Some of you are spoiled brats. Every time you ever got in trouble, somebody in your house got you out of it. Every time you've done something you're not supposed to do, people say, Eric, your mother's a tyrant. You're right. She kicked me out. You're right. She's mean, but she developed a man because she put me out there and said, you're going to have to grow up. And some of you have never learned to grow up. And so every time something get hard, you quit, you call mama. I dare you to take a little pain. I dare you. I dare you not to go home. Somebody said, I got to go home. I feel bad. Go, go through it. You ain't gonna die at the end of pain and success. You're not gonna die because you're feeling a little pain. I'm not eating like I eat at home. That's why you're about to go to the next level because if you keep eating like you ate at home, you will keep being a boy or a girl. It's time to become man, woman. So don't, don't worry about a little pain. There's a, a bunch of people that will say, yeah, well, I have a family, so, you know, it's a great idea for you to just go out there and go crazy. I have people to support. You need to listen. Stop saying that. Stop saying any of those things. Every single person who has ever done anything worthwhile or exceptional or difficult or extraordinary, anyone, whether it's great artists or authors or mathematicians or whatever the f it is, Everyone encounters difficulties. There is no easy road. It does not exist. It is impossible. Everyone has issues. If you have time to pursue a hobby, if you have time to do anything in your life, you can better yourself. And here's one way you never better yourself. When you come up with excuses for why other people are successful and you're not, that is dangerous when you give yourself an escape yeah well that's easy for you to say you know you do this you do, 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 do. And to tr trust me everybody has a hard road i wanted to jump out a window several times during my young life i wanted to jump in front of a f train and just end it because it's too much pressure not really but you know what i'm saying theoretically we all go through hard times. We all go through depression. We all do go through doubt and and then moments in your life where it's really f difficult and you're trying to figure out what the f your path is going to be. It's hard as sh But Stefan and I were talking about this before the podcast starts that that is what makes you a person. And those difficult moments are what build your character. Show me a great man who's the son of a great man. You know that's what we're saying. These kids that are born billionaires, you're f you're f you're never going to be a self-made person. You have a backup trust for your backup trust for your trust, and you're f man. Experiencing uh, pain in your muscles and aching, and just then go on and go on and then go on, and this last two or three or four repetitions, that's what makes actually the muscle then grow, and that uh, divides then one from a champion and one from not being a champion. If you can go through this pain barrier, you make it to be a champion. If you can go through, forget it. And that's where most people lack is on this having the guts. The guts to go in and just say, I go through and I don't care what happens. You know, it aches and if I fall down, I have, I have no fear of fainting in the gym because I know it's, it, it could happen. I threw up many times while I was working out, but it doesn't matter because it's all worth it. And one does have to be focused on the short term and money coming in when creating a company because otherwise the company will, will die. So that the I think that a lot of times people think like creating a company is going to be fun. I would say it's not. It's really not that fun. I mean, there are periods of fun, and there are, there are periods of where it's, where it's just awful. Um, and particularly if you're the CEO of the company, um, you actually have a distillation of all the worst problems in the company. Um, there's no point in spending your time on things that are going right. 
So you only spend on things on your time on things that are going wrong. And, and there are things that are going wrong that other people can't, can't take care of. So you have like the worst. You have a filter for the crappest problem in the company, <laughs> the most pernicious and painful problem. Um, so I wouldn't say it's, it's it, I think you have to feel quite compelled to do it um, and have a, a fairly high pain threshold. And there's a friend of mine who, who says like starting a company is like staring into the abyss and, and eating glass. Um, and there's some truth to that. Um, the staring into the abyss part is that you're going to be constantly facing the, the um, extermination of the company. Because uh, most, most startups fail. Uh, it's like 90%, arguably 99% of, of startups fail. So, uh, so you, you, that, that's the staring into the abyss part. You're constantly saying, okay, this, if, if, if I don't get this right, the company will die. Um, it should be quite stressful. Quite stressful. And, and then um, the eating glass part is you've got, you've got to do you've got to do the problems you've got to, you've got to work on the problems that the company needs you to work on not the problems you want to work on and, and so that, the, that's you end up working on problems that, that uh, you'd really wish you weren't working on and so that's, that's the eating glass part um, and that goes on for a long time so how do you keep your focus on the big picture when you're constantly faced with we could be out of business in a month Well, it's, it's just a very small percentage of mental energies on the on the big picture. Like you know, you know, you know where you're, you're generally heading heading for, and and the, the actual path is going to be some sort of zigzaggy thing in that direction. Um, and try not to deviate too far from the path that that, that you want to be on, but you're going to have to do that to some degree. Um, but I, I don't want to I don't want to diminish the. I mean, I think the prof, the profit motive is a, is a is a good one if the rules of an industry are properly set up. So there's nothing fundamentally wrong with profit. In fact, profit just means that uh, people are paying you more for, the, for whatever you're doing than you're spending to create it. That's a good thing. <laughs> and and if, if, you're not, if, if that's not the case, then you'll be out of business, and rightfully so. Because you're, you're, you're not adding enough value. The key is what we do in our times of pain. Pain will change us. Heartache, loss, disappointments, they don't leave us the same. When I lost my father, I didn't come out like I was before. I was changed. If you go through a divorce, a legal battle, a friend betrays you, eventually that will pass. You'll get through it, but you will be different. Now, how the pain changes you is up to you. You can come out bitter, or you can come out better. You can come out with a chip on your shoulder blaming God, or you can come out stronger with a greater confidence in God. You can come out defeated, giving up on your dreams, or you can come out with a new passion, a new fire, excited about the new opportunities in front of you. All of us experience pain. My challenge, don't just go through it, grow through it. That difficulty is an opportunity to get stronger, to develop character, to gain new confidence. Anybody can give up. Anybody can let it overwhelm you. But you know what that's doing? Wasting your pain. That pain is not there to stop you. It's there to prepare you, to increase you, to develop you. People used to take my wraps and crunch them up and throw them on the ground. I used to get made fun of all the time because who believes that the, the guy sitting next to the math class is gonna blow up and become a superstar? You don't believe right. that, right? But like, you should've. And it's a bummer, you know what I mean? Because I, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, take it, take it and make, you know, pain is the best inspiration. So if you're a creative out there and you're getting bullied, take it and make something great out of it. Now, I know that I personally have experienced quite a bit of disappointment in my life, and I'm assuming that you have as well. And guess what? We're going to continue to be disappointed throughout our lives. At least we should be, because if you're not, that means that you're really not trying. Now, how you handle yourself post-disappointment, this is critical to your emotional and mental well-being. Pain. 
pain, hurting, right? It's part of the growing process. But I'll tell you something. Life has a funny way of closing doors in order to keep you moving in the right direction, all right? So often in our society and as people, we run from pain. We do everything we can to protect ourselves and to shield ourselves from feeling uncomfortable with that feeling of pain. And this is the reason why so many people abuse drugs, alcohol, casual sex. We do this to not feel the pain, but I'm saying stop running. Stop trying to mask it, all right? When you feel pain, disappointment, it's okay. Don't try and cover it up. What you should do is actually embrace it. I know it's, e it's easy for me sitting here saying, oh, embrace the pain. You're feeling like crap. Don't worry about it. Feel it. Feel it. I get it, right? That's not, that's kind of a long shot. But what I'm saying is that the pain is normal, it's natural, it's a part of the growth process. Learn from it. Once you do, you accept it, you embrace it, learn from it, put it in its place, you're gonna be able to move forward stronger, faster, smarter. If you're not struggling and getting disappointed from time to time, this probably means that you're not really pushing your limits too far, all right? It's okay. Embrace it, don't get discouraged, and stay focused. Pain is a beautiful thing. Challenge is what life is about. A life without challenge, a life without pain, is a life without growth. And where there is no growth, there is stale, stagnant energy. And that's where most people live. Because most people's lives are designed around treading a path that is void of challenge. The minute they recognize challenge or pain, they move the other way. This is a primal instinct and normal and natural, but a weak perspective. Most people are bored if you ask them, what do you think about your life? <sighs> same old, same old. Every single day, what is the thing? Same day, same shit, different day, things of this nature. That's because they're living their lives in a lie that is shrouded in comfort. It doesn't exist. They're not challenged, they're not growing, they're bored and they're better off dead. Your aliveness is found in your pain. Is life about how much you've done with technology, how much you've achieved, how much money you made in your life? Or is life about how many times you laughed compared to smiled? I would rather have a happier life. And sure, if getting success in business is what makes me happy, that's fine. But um, I really believe that, you know, some kind of enjoyment aspect should pr go through, especially all learning and all work. Now, I was an engineer. The work is hard. It's intense. You work late hours at night sometimes trying to solve a problem, you know, and you just, it's so hard to get there and you finally crack through and it's sort of a relief. But you know what? When you're working that hard all day long, you need those little jokes with your friends. You need the lunchtime where you can sit down and chat. It's such a big part of your life. Things, getting things is not gonna make you happy. That's good news in a tough economy, it's a good reminder. You know, it doesn't matter what you get, it doesn't matter whether it be money or opportunity, all those things might excite you for the moment. You know, even a relationship, as magnificent it may be, might be exciting for a while, but if you don't keep growing, that relationship isn't gonna stay exciting. So the secret to real happiness is progress. Progress equals happiness, and if we can make progress on a regular basis, we feel alive, and that's why at the beginning of the year we get this thing like, okay, I can have this fresh start, I can really do what my soul desires, I can expand, I can grow, I can improve, I can change, or maybe better than change, I could progress. See, think about that, progress is an aliveness to it, doesn't it? You don't have to work at changing. People say all the time now, well, I'm, I'm working on changing. Don't worry about it. You don't have to work on changing. Change is automatic. Your body's going to change whether you want it or not as the years go by. And no matter how hard you work, there's going to be some changes going on there. The economy is going to change no matter what you want it to do. The weather is going to change. Relationships are going to change. Everything in life is always changing. We don't have to work on change. Change is automatic, but progress is not. So if you want to make real progress, then you really got to look at your life in a different way. You got to say, I gotta take control of this process and not just hope it's gonna work out like people do who make a resolution. A lot of comedians go out on stage and they're hiding who they are. Because mm -hmm. we know there's a lot of comedians come from a dark place. They do. Mm -hmm. You let it all out. There. I come from a happy place. Even yeah. though my place was dark, I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy simply because I, I, I have no reason to be angry. 
uh, life is too short to be angry. So the things that I do feel a certain type of way about it that I may get upset about, I let it out. I get it out on stage and I allow other people to judge it and laugh at it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you're laughing is because I'm being honest. And I think when people can relate to that honesty. The truth is always the funniest. It is the funniest. I don't care what happens to you. There is a positive and a negative in anything that happens to you. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it after you're done being negative, I guarantee you'll laugh. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you'll laugh. I don't care how bad, how severe it is, after it's happened, when you really break down what happened. The human condition, right? Oh my goodness, you're gonna It takes some time yeah. sometimes. Well, sometimes, if you really, sometimes, give sometimes. a couple hours. Give, give a couple, couple hours. hours. You have to own your own happiness. Uh, take it away from other people demanding that they make you happy. Your kids are not going to make you happy. Your spouse is not going to make you happy. A big house is not going to make you happy. Own your own happiness and be responsible for doing those things that bring joy into your own heart independently of life and people and money and all of that stuff. Right. It doesn't necessarily give you a happiness. You have to take responsibility of that peace and that joy that lives inside of your heart and not inside of your stuff. I had a dream to come to Barcelona, but afterwards I'm thinking maybe you should keep your dream instead of making it come through. Because that dream could almost, not almost, could have not destroyed me, but make it difficult for me. And the first six months, fantastic. I had a fantastic time. I had a very good relationship with Guardiola. I wanted to learn the Barcelona, the way of playing. It went good the first six months. After that, something happened that I still don't have answers for, which, which maybe I will never know. I mean, if somebody has a problem with me, should come to me and we resolve it. Whatever the problem is, like a man, because it was, it was ridiculous. You don't talk to the player, the player is looking for answers. At that moment, I was not happy. And I said, I have to choose. Either I stay, win everything, but I will not be happy, or I go to somewhere else, and that is what happened. I went to Milan. My joy came back for playing football. I did a good job. I won the, the Scudetto immediately. I won the Supercoppa. Everybody was happy and they were like appreciating me for playing there. She's worried about the rent, okay? She's a single mother. She's worried about her worry kid. about the rent. You know, there's nothing you can do about the rent and worrying about it. I ain't gonna get you no rent. Presence and happiness gets you rent. Money can't make you happy, but happy can make you money. So be happy, go out in the world. Look, the story of the guy in the shanty house, he rolls over in the morning, meditates, goes out into the world. It's like, damn, I'm gonna have to get some bread and water before the whole shit go down, before I get back in that bed. But in the meantime, be nice to all my neighbors in the shanty village. Everybody is suffering in what everyone else calls extreme poverty, but he's happy. He didn't have a poverty mindset. Nor is he worried about that bread and water. They gonna give me some bread. I ain't gonna worry about that shit, cause I'm that dude. He walks out smiling, confident, comfortable. He gets what he needs. He says, the Yogananda would say, God will provide, but really, you're know, God, you're working to get, and it shows up. He gets his bread and water. He makes everybody happy. Everybody makes him happy, lays in the bed. Next nigga, he wakes up. <laughs> He's got, you know, you know, $36 billion in the bank. He gets up, the stock market goes up. He says, oh, shit. he gets some Coke, gets some alcohol. He gets happy, he's so excited, I'm exploding. I'm making more money, more money, more money. Oh, shit, it crashed, oh, shit. more cocaine, more alcohol. Oh, shit, I'm fucked up, I'm fucked up. His heart goes up and down, um, and he dies at 40. The shanty house guy lives, at 100, lives to 100. If he had the other guy's diet, not the diet the other guy took, but the other guy's opportunity for having a greater diet, the guy in the shanty house made, would have made 120. But, you know, made 100. This guy died at 40. That's the reality of our, you know, our happiness is up to us. You know, our relationship with the world is up to us. Our anxiety is controlled or given to us by us. Sometimes you have to just say, like, why would you want to make the situation miserable? Uh -huh. I go to photo shoots and I actually working with Pantene, they were so sweet and just like you're so nice and and, and they, they they said that to me yeah. as if that was shocking and I looked at them I'm like why would I want to make this miserable for you and me like we're taking pretty pictures I'm flinging my hair around <laughs> like it's 
you have a choice. Yeah. It's like, if you want to be happy, be happy. And that's so hard to yeah. do sometimes, but it's something that I just have come to terms with more than ever lately in my life. And I think people just see that. I got called to do a uh, Harvard and Yale to go speak. Um, and I said I would do it after my album come out. Wow. What are you going to say to them at Harvard and Yale? I'm going to tell them my story. I'm going to give them my, 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 my story of my life. Um, and, you know what I'm saying, I'm sure it connects in some way with their life. You know what I'm saying? Like, and in different aspects. You know what I'm saying? I feel like we all have a connection with all, all of our stories. We've all been through trials and tribulations. And we've all been through great things. You know what I'm saying? It's just about, I think my message now is for everybody to find happiness and joy. I've told you this um, years ago on your mm. show that I've been searching for happiness and joy mm. even though I'm super blessed and we got life it's just a feeling I was searching for and I'm finding that now are and you happy I, yeah now I am wow and, and when I say that because I'm about to have a son mm. you know what I'm saying and all the blessings that's coming in me more blessings because we, we bless out the gate because we got life but you know what I mean like more blessings and you know like fan love I go outside right now they show me love, man. Like they, they show me so much love. I like I, how could I be mad? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I get You know that. what I'm saying? Like, and that's what I mean about keep positive energy around you, and that's how you're gonna be happy. You know what I'm saying? And I notice in my life when you keep certain negative energy around you, you don't want it around you, but sometimes it's just there. And you have to be a man or a woman and say, you know what? Let me take the trash out. Word. You know what I'm saying? One day you got to wake up and say that. And it's the hardest thing in the world because, you know, you don't just do that. You know what I'm saying? You sometimes have to walk away from situations. You went to Harvard and you dropped out. Have you ever thought how your life could be better off if you had gotten your Harvard degree? Well, I, I'm a weird dropout because I take college courses all the time. I love... Uh, learning company courses and, and things. So I loved being a student. And there were smart people around and the, you know they fed you and they gave you these nice grades that made you feel smart. Uh, so I, I feel it was unfortunate uh, that I didn't get to stay there. But I don't think I missed any knowledge because you know whatever I needed to learn, I, would, I was still in a, a learning mode. Look, why, why don't we change everything after the person? Be myself, just me, Jackie Chan. That takes a lot of confidence. Yeah. Unbelievable. And also, I really thank you, you know, the, the, the producer, Wu mm. uh, He said, okay, do whatever you like to do. Yeah, change, no Bruce Lee, comedy. When Bruce Lee kick high, I kick low. When Bruce Lee, after punch, uh, I do, wow. <laughs> No, just like normal human being. Normal when I was young, I'm fighting on the street. One by one, boom, I knock somebody down. Two by one, I knock somebody down. Three, I run away. So in the movie, do the same thing. I just, everything used in the movie, use my, it's my real life. I think it's again, again, it goes back to a, a bit of what Warren was saying as well. Like, it's the discipline as well. The discipline to not get caught up in the moment. You know, music is like stocks too. You know, there's the hot thing of the moment. You know, there's this hot electro sound or the hot auto-tuned voice or the hot uh, whatever, whatever's new and exciting. And you know, you know, people tend to make emotional decisions based on that. You know, stick with what they know. This is who I am. This is, you know, this is what I do. And then they, you know, jump on this next hot thing. And you know, it's, it's not for you. So for me, just having the discipline and having the confidence that, and, and who I am, you know, and if I go into a studio and, and, and if I find my truth of the moment, there, there, there are a number of people in the world that can relate to what I'm saying and, and it's gonna um, buy into what I'm doing. You know, not because it's the new thing of the moment, but because it's my genuine emotions. It's how I feel. It's how I articulate the world. And, you know, just having the discipline and just, you know, be yourself. Man, you just got to stay real to yourself. You know, don't ever try and follow the trends. That's when you get lost in the sauce, man. You got to 
do what you feel, man, and be creative and don't be scared to be yourself and always keep that faith. You know, I've been in the darkest times of my life, man, where I didn't know what was going to happen or was flat broke. Anything you could think of, man, I done been through it and like, you know, you got to be strong enough to make it through and it, it just makes it that much sweeter when everything starts going right. Steve was an original and I don't think there's another one of those being made. And so I've never really viewed or, or felt the weight of trying to be Steve. It's just, it's not who I am and uh, uh, it's not my goal in life. You know? uh, I'm, I am who I am and that's, that I'm focused on that and, and being uh, a great CEO of Apple. What did I learn from the youth of 11 million people? I learned every youth wants to be unique. Every youth wants to be unique. That is you. Every youth wants to be unique. That is you. But the world around, uh, around you is doing its best day and night to make you just everybody else. Now, now, the question is whether you want to be you or everybody else. You? You want to be you? Yes. Not everybody else. Now, if the question being like everybody else is convenient at the first glance, but not satisfying in the long vision, the challenge, therefore, my young friends, is that you have to fight the hardest battle. You have to fight the hardest battle which any human being can ever imagine to fight and never stop fighting until you arrive at your destined place. That is the unique view. I just think that people, it's, it's pointless for people to get into a creative uh, arena and say, I want to be the best. I mean, you know, there are, everyone has what they have. They say what they say, and you could never compare, you know, Picasso with Leger. I mean, you have to, everybody has something different to say. Um, and it's silly to get in there and say, my brush stroke is better than another person's. No. You know, it's better to say, am I being true to myself, and is this what I want to say, and have I expressed myself? you know, the way I want to express myself. No. I mean, that's what it's all about. If you try to be something that you are not, then obviously it's not going to work for long very well. I mean, I don't think you will enjoy your life if you just try to make other people happy and not uh, don't uh, do what you feel is the right thing for yourselves. I'm fans of athletes from all different sports. I've never tried to emulate anyone else. I, I've tried to be myself. Um, I've learned a lot from watching guys, um, you know, especially guys when I was younger. But I think uh, in terms of leadership, I think leadership is viewed differently by different people. I mean, there's, there's people that lead by example. Um, there's people that are vocal leaders, people that do a little bit of both. Uh, I think you just have to be who you are. I had a job out of college um, working for a bank for a short period of time, Mellon Bank, and I um, decided to, well first, um, it might have been Inc. Magazine, this is way back when, but there was an article about using, changing something in how you deduct social, how you save social security from employees' paychecks. And li I, I literally hadn't been working there for three weeks. And so I sent it to the CEO of Mellon Bank. Hey, I thought you might be interested in this. Literally some guy he never heard of. And I got an OPEC said thank you. And I'm thinking, OK, you look, my whole job, my whole motive in taking a job working for somebody was to help them become more profitable. That's the way I always looked at it. And then I started a rookies club where I reached out to some executives and all the people who had started at the same time at Mellon Bank. We'd all go out and get a drink, and we'd get this executive started. 
and I didn't like run it through my boss or anything. And so my boss at the time um, calls me in and said, you're doing this, this. I said, yeah, I think he's gonna say great. He's just starts screaming at me and reaming me. How could you do this? You go everything through me, you work for me. Yeah, so I knew I wasn't destined there. And then um, I, I left and I went down to, um, ended up down in Dallas and got a job working for a company called Your Business Software. And we were, we sold software and, and I didn't know anything about software. I took one computer class at Indiana and kind of cheated to pass. Um, but, not that I condone that, but. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, I had a customer and I, I taught my, I'd stay up all night teach, reading. I figured, you know, computers were new and technology was new. Um, this technology was new, so no way had a head start on me because it was changing so rapidly like it is today that if I just put in the time, I can learn as much as anybody else. And so I taught myself, I'd stay up late reading software manuals, um, taught myself different little simple programming languages and kept on getting bigger and bigger and better and better, but it was at a retail store. And one of my responsibilities was to come in, sweep the floor, wipe down the windows and open the store. And I had a customer who wanted me to come out there and close the deal. And it was a $15,000 deal, $1,500 commission to me. Told my boss, he said, no, you need to be there to open the store. And I made the executive decision that I was gonna go get the check. Cause you know, I was living six guys in a three bedroom apartment, sleeping on the floor. And this check meant I could like not use the same holiday Inn towels with holes in them that I'd stolen, you know. Um, but anyway, so I went and picked up the check thinking when I came back and gave the check to my boss, all would be forgiven and you know, the sales cures all, fired me, fired me. And so those back to back experiences confirmed what I already knew that, that I was a <laughs> employee and then I better start my own. I'm sure Henry will tell you, any fighter the knows what's happening. You really can't plan a fight when you're meeting a man you've never met before, right? You just have to get your tools ready. Here's a car stops on the highway. They call the AAA or whatever and say, my car's broke down. What it is, the lady, she don't know what's broke. Well, the man comes with all the tools and he come equipped to handle whatever the problem is. An astronaut goes into space and he pretends that something happens to the ship before he take off. He gets out and he works on it. He's not looking for something to happen, but it might happen so I didn't know I just had everything ready now after the first round being here with a top professional a man so great had so many knockouts never been defeated never been even scratched I didn't know really how good he was so I had to come in actually a little nervous and with everything ready after one round of dancing I found out that this would tire me out so I would have to resort to ropes. I figured that out after the first round. So I said, I'm going to go to these ropes, and I'm going to let this man throw everything he can, let him tire himself out. He might look like he's winning, and if he don't hurt me, I'm going to stay here. But if he should be as great as they say he is, if he hits as hard as they say he hit, when he hits you and breaks your arm, he knocked out Joe Frazier, I couldn't do it, knocked out Ken Norton, he was a big, bad jab before the fight, you remember. Now, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, I do. How bad he was? <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that now, but you remember he was a real bad cat the other day, right? Don't forget that. Now, after I found out he didn't have it, I stayed there. But if he had had what I thought he had had or what they said he'd had, I'd have kept running, hoping I wouldn't get tired. You do very strong characters in pretty much everything. You have very strong decisions. Do you make those decisions before you start and then kind of come to the set with what you're going to do and then adjust in small ways or are you well the, the the way i always approach it is this that um uh, i i like to have uh, my own ideas completely worked out so that if a director i come to find his working method is that he doesn't want to talk to me mm -hmm. um that i'm not at a loss there's nothing worse. I've seen other actors who stand and somebody shouts action and they're just going, I, I don't know what to do. I need, they, they need somebody to come and tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. I never look at a director as somebody who tells me what to do. I look at it as someone who we work together mm -hmm. in something and therefore I need to be responsible too. So I have to bring something to the table mm -hmm. and say, I will do it this way. If you never say it, if you keep silent, this is how I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And I'll give a few different versions, but it, it, would be, it wouldn't matter if uh, they said nothing. Through that stage in Apple where we went out and we thought, oh, we're gonna be a big company, let's hire professional management. 
We went out and hired a bunch of professional management. It didn't work at all. Most of them were bozos. They, they knew how to manage, but they didn't know how to do anything. And so well, if you're a great person, why do you want to work for somebody you can't learn anything from? Uh, and you know what's interesting? You know who the best managers are? They're the great individual contributors who never ever want to be a manager, but decide they have to be a manager because all, every, no one else is going to be able to do as good a job as them. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did, but we're, we're not necessarily those seasoned professionals, but who had on at the tips of their fingers and in their passion, the latest understanding of where technology was and what we could do with that technology and who wanted to bring that to, to lots of people. So the neatest thing that happens is when you get a core group of, uh, you know, 10 great people, they, it becomes self-policing as to who they let into that group. So I consider the most important job of someone uh, like myself is recruiting. The best way I came up with to affect change at Apple was by example. And that was probably more than anything else, the key reason that I spent two and a half years of my life on Macintosh was to try by example to say, hey, here's a better way to do things. And it turns out it's worked. I mean, er almost everything at Apple now has looked at the Macintosh experience and come in and said, hey, we can take a lot of these concepts and apply them, make them better in some ways, and model, you know, every other factory we're doing now is modeled after the Macintosh factory. Every other product team that's doing new product is being modeled after the Macintosh team. The group of people that do not use quality in their marketing are the Japanese. You never see them using quality in their marketing. It's only the American companies that do. And yet, if you ask people on the street which products have the best reputation for quality, they will tell you the Japanese products. Now, why is that? How could that be? The answer is because customers don't form their opinions on quality from marketing. They don't form their opinions on quality from who won the, uh, the Deming Award or who won the Baldrige Award. They form their opinions on quality from their own experience with the products or the services. And so one can spend enormous amounts of money on quality. One can win every quality award there is. And yet if your products don't live up to it, customers will not keep that opinion for long in their minds. And so I think where we have to start is with our products and our services, not with our marketing department. And we need to get back to the basics and go improve our products and services. Now again, quality isn't just the product or the service. It's having the right product, you know, knowing where the market's going and having the most innovative products is just as much a part of quality as the quality of the construction of the product when you have it. And I think what we're seeing is the quality leaders of today have integrated that quality technology well beyond their manufacturing now going well into their sales and marketing and out as far as they can to touch the customer and trying to, to create super efficient processes back from the customer all the way through to the delivery of the end product so that they can have the most innovative products, understand the customer needs fastest, et cetera, et cetera. How many of you feel like I've made this talk before? Can I see your hand, please? Several hundred times I made it yesterday. You know what I did between yesterday and today? I spent over six hours getting ready for today. You see, I think it would be arrogant if I thought I could stand up and spit it out just because I did it yesterday or hundreds of times. That's arrogance. That's when Buster Douglas knocks out Mike Tyson. That's when an expansion team in Houston beats an established NFL team in Dallas. I dare not. Look at the people here, several thousand. I'm taking over an hour. Of time. That's several thousand hours of time. Where would my integrity be if I came here unprepared to make something, a presentation that could make a difference in your life? There is no way. You got to prepare for it, ladies and gentlemen. To me, it became much, it's become much more about craft. And I think actually on a smaller scale, though I think it's possible to do it on a really big scale, but I think that on a smaller scale, I think preparation is key. That um, I kind of went back to deciding or sort of choosing preparation over everything and the amount of time it takes when you have a lot less money to use. You know, and you have to make choices very specifically and they have to be kind of prepared much earlier on so that you're free in you know, a very small period of space, you have mm -hmm. a lot more freedom because of all the preparation that you've done. 
that was a that I mean just in terms of the 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 process of acting that's what I um I started to learn when I did um End of Watch this movie with David Ayer you know I spent five months with police officers and that was sort of the beginning of realizing how much I loved preparation and how much I loved the process before the performance and I had always loved that when I was on stage because there's always that very formal rehearsal process mm -hmm. that allows you to explore and use your mind and go to places that are wrong as well as places that are right. And I love being wrong and right, you know, and I love people saying, mm, that idea doesn't really work for this, you know, when I'm ex having an exchange with the director. I love that. I love the... I love that kind of I'm bringing an idea and it gets vetoed or it gets accepted. Whatever it is, it's just the ability to bring ideas. And I see that it's much more possible to do that within the, the, the prep time than it is in the moment of shooting. Well, you know, you all, you know, management is, is I think, is kind of a relentless process. So I guess first, like someone said to me, what, ha what, ha what changed in the crisis versus before? Nothing. It's like, if you're, if you're not prepared for tough times, you're not gonna be, you can't like get prepared when times get tough. Like you need the army before the war starts. And so that means a disciplined group, they know what they're doing. The only real difference is that the, our risk committee used to meet once a week for a couple hours. And in the crisis, it met at 7 a.m., 12, you know, lunchtime, five o'clock, 10 o'clock, 5 a.m. if it had to, 24 seven for six straight months. And, and we didn't say, it wasn't very formal. We said, hey, if you got a problem, go to the meeting and bring the people you gotta have. And everyone shares the reports and shares the information, tries to react very quickly. You need luck because I have seen lots of smart people, lots of people who have worked hard. They haven't been blessed. And you need luck. But at the same time, let's remember uh, Louis Pasteur's words that God favors the prepared mind. So you have to be prepared to take advantage of that luck. Luck you need, but be prepared to seize that luck. A lot of people come to me and they say, well, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I go, oh, that's great. What's your idea? And they go, well, I don't have one yet. And I say, well, I think you should go get a job as a busboy or something until you find something you're really passionate about because it's a lot of work. And I'm convinced that about half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. It is so hard. You pour so much of your life into this thing. There are such rough moments in time that most people give up. I don't blame them. I mean, it's really tough. And it consumes your life. I mean, if, you're, if you've got a family, and you're in the early days of a company, it's, I can't imagine how one could do it. I'm sure it's, it's been done, but it's rough. I mean, because it's a pretty much, a, you know, an 18 hour a day job, seven days a week for a while. So, unless you have a lot of passion about this, you're gonna not survive, you're gonna give it up. So you gotta have an idea, of, and a, or a, a problem, or a, a, a wrong that you wanna write, that you're passionate about, otherwise, you're not gonna have the perseverance to stick it through. And I think that's half the battle right there. It's hard to remember how bad it was, you know, in 19, early 80s. With IBM taking over the world with the PC, with DOS out there, it was, it was far worse than the Apple II. And they tried to copy the Apple II and they'd done a pretty bad job and it, you needed to know a lot. And so things were kind of slipping backwards and Macintosh was, you saw the 1984 commercial. You put the, I hope you have that in your archives. You know, Macintosh was basically this, uh, this relatively small company, you know, in Cupertino, California, taking on the Goliath, IBM, and saying, wait a minute, your way is wrong. This is not the way we want computers to go. This is not the legacy we want to leave. This is not what we want our kids to be learning. This is wrong, and we are going to show you the right way to do it. And here it is, it's called Macintosh, and this is so much better that it's going to beat you. And we are going to do it. If you're going to get into something, you got to be prepared and you got to do something big. Mm -hmm. You know, and you got to, you got to, you know, I feel like this power record with me and Lil Wayne, 
it's definitely a statement record, but it, it's just real, it's timing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I tell you all the time, I ain't on my time, we on God's time. Absolutely. So, how LeBron James or one of them feel when they're in the gym, you gotta go practice, work on your jump shot. Right. You know, work on your game. I feel like artists now need to spend that time in the studio than just partying all day. What advice do you have for the future of making great records? Know what you're doing. Study everything. You know, study music. You know, because I, I'm hearing some funny stuff now that it drives me crazy. I, I'll talk to some of the producers today. We were doing an amazing project in, in uh, Rabat, Morocco last year. We had all of the number one singers in the Arab Spring, from Libya, Egypt, Jordan, Aleppo, Damascus, everywhere. And we were recording over there. And, call no names over there and I said do you read music he said yeah I used to but I forgot give me a break man you don't forget how to read music but the, 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 the man you have to understand that put the work in to learn the science man you do you can't play a trumpet if you don't know how to you know you have to, it's a science of armatures the diaphragmatic breathing there's a lot of secrets with everything you uh, attempt to do you know Retrograde, inversion, and counterpoint. It, it's been, I say, there's only 12 notes, man. So you can figure out what you have to do to get your own sound. You have to do that through rhythm, melody, and, and harmony. And you have to do a lot of research to figure that out. You know, you have to know what's going on. You have to understand, I don't know, Ravel and Alpenberg and Basie and Duke and Bo Diddley and and Melly Mel and Ludacris and, and, and Drake and all of them. Come on, man. You know, it's, a, it's doing your homework, man. That's all I can say. Prepare yourself, because my thing was, I was all, my biggest fear, and I don't play with that word at all, uh, was to get a great opportunity that I'm not prepared for. So when Frank Sinatra called me, man, I was ready for him. I'm telling you. And he, he tests me. He really, Ray Charles, too, because those guys are rough, man. Billy Eckstein, Ray Charles, Frank Sinatra, they will kick your booty, you know. And he'd say to me in the first, we'd do, do an arrangement at Capitol Studios. He'd say, Q, that uh, first eight was a little dense. I said, no problem, man. And I put all the horn, the trumpets and the harmony mutes, pull the stems out, transfer the saxophones to the alto flutes and stuff like, let's go. He was testing me, he only did it three times. And after that, he said he knows what he's doing. And I, cause I was ready for it. And that's the biggest compliment, man, and accomplishment you can have in your life is to say, I got my stuff together. I got my shit together. And this goes back to my Boy Scout days, is be prepared. Uh, I know what you're thinking, you're already prepared, you've uh, mapped out the rest of your life, the rest of your education, postgraduate work, residences, residency, residences, uh, fellowships, uh, clerkships, and uh, you're going to have a long, meaningful co career. You have all of your plans already laid down. Uh, that's not the preparation I am talking about because, let me tell you, the likelihood of you winding up 10 years from now doing what you think you're going to be doing 10 years from now is probably less than 1 in 10. The truth of the matter is you don't know what opportunities are going to be presented to you. You don't know where you're going to succeed and where you're going to fail. Uh, the careers that you wind up in are invariably going to be very different. So um, what I would do is I would focus on how I interact with people, how I approach problems, I would get involved in government. If you want to go into public service, I would recommend you first become a billionaire, but that's another issue. Um, you're going to spend your entire life doing something different than what you think. And the good news is that Dartmouth is preparing you for that, because while you think they're individual subjects, what they're really teaching you to do is to think and to reason and to build relationships, and that's what's going to carry you. When this whole thing with Gizmodo happened, I got a lot of advice from people that said, you've got to just let it slide. You can't, uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't go after a journalist because they bought stolen property and they tried to extort you. 
you should let it slide. Apple's a big company now. You don't want the PR. You should let it slide. And I thought deeply about this, and I ended up concluding that the worst thing that could possibly happen as we get big and we get a little more influence in the world is if we change our core values and start letting it slide. I can't do that. I'd rather quit. You know, you go back five years ago, what would we have done if something like this happened? You go back 10 years ago, uh, you know, what would you do if, if uh, uh, without going into that, it, we had the same values now as we had then. We're maybe a little more experienced, certainly more beat up, uh, but, but the core values are the same. And we come into work wanting to do the same thing today as, as we did five or 10 years ago, which is build the best products for people. You know, there's nothing that makes my day more than getting an email from some random person in the universe who just bought an iPad over in the UK and tells me the story about how it's the coolest product they've ever brought home, you know, in their lives. That's what keeps me going. And it's what kept me going five years ago. It's what kept me going 10 years ago when the doors were almost closed. Uh, and it's what will keep me going five years from now, whatever happens. So. I don't see why you have to change if you get big.